for the spring. That's over at Mojave Water Agency meeting the new, the new general manager over there. Um, the new general manager. Yeah. Sorry, I, I know water agency people. I say that again. Who's the new general manager? I, oh. At oh, yeah. Mojave Water Agency, his name is Tom McCarthy. The old general manager was Kirby Brill. Did you know him? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I um, did a scholarship for Mojave Water Agency. Oh, so look at the, awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah, look at the Mojave Water Summit for 2016. So I know them. I was just surprised. because. Were you in the Skater Academy at that time? or? Skater Academy? That's yeah. No. no, I wasn't. I oh, just, you did your own? You know the Mojave Water Summit? Oh, you did that. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to be talking to you guys about that because that's another thing we were talking about to the new general management, Tom McCarthy, was how we get you guys. You know you've got that writing assignment. Um, yeah. Then you, you could use that, um, that as getting ready for your presentation at the summit. So who was that talking, by the way? Uh, that was Enrique alone. Okay, all right. Cool. So maybe you can lead the charge with that in terms of, I'd like to have several of your students make your presentation, your research uh, student presentation, so that uh, by February, they're going to hold it in February, you guys would be able to present at that and be eligible for that, uh, what is it, a $5,000 scholarship or something? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. It was cool. $5,000 that I won it, and then last year was 3000 You actually won it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why I spoke there. I was the introductory speaker in 2016. Oh, I was there. Yeah, okay. All right, and now you're in this class. That's awesome. All right, well, let's, uh, yeah. let's get together then. Maybe we should have a meeting with you and Mrs. Pike, and we can talk about how we take these, those writing projects, you know, your presentation, and structure them to where a lot of people could take advantage of being part of that. Okay? <laughs> Sound good? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, we lost, go ahead. We lost our um, bit. We can't see you. Oh. Uh, Brian? I put the PowerPoint. If you hit none, it'll go back. Okay. So, but. Can't, shouldn't they be able to see me and the PowerPoint? We can't see anything except for a black screen. Oh, a black screen. Okay, that means you've lost the uh, connection. Brian, Brian will sort us out again. We'll take a, we'll stop for a second, sorry. So we're live, yeah. Okay, there we go. All right, so today, lecture five. Uh, you guys okay now? You can, you've got, the, you've got the, the PowerPoint in front of you. We're going to talk about yeah. the background uh, to all of this, the sort of the international scene. We're, we're talking about sustainable agriculture, but what does the conventional agriculture look like, what we call industrial agriculture, and what's going on with food in general? What's the situation? We, we, what's up with food shortages and malnutrition? And, and all that kind of information that sets up the context, basically, for later in the class, we're going to focus much more on sustainable agriculture and some of the economics and some of the policy. Okay, so food security is what we're talking about, and nutrition. Um, we actually have enough food in the world. The problem is it's here, or it's in Europe. Or it's in Ireland. I was listening to a show about this yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago. And we can't get it to where it's needed. Where it's needed is in Central Africa, Central Northern Africa, the Sudan, where they've got terrible uh, war and crisis. And also their land is being overgrazed and going to desert, which we'll talk what we call desertification. We can't get it to them. So it's a... A distribution problem, okay? Um, and this leads to food insecurity. Basically, you don't know where your food's coming from, and B, we're going to look at, at malnutrition, which is maybe I've got enough food, but I don't, it's not nutritionally correct, okay? I don't, for example, have enough protein. 
or I'm missing certain vitamins. So an example of that would be, and a solution, is golden rice. There's a vitamin A uh, deficiency all over the world, leads to night blindness, leads to uh, early, uh, actually maternal losses in, in, in women that are carrying children in certain situations. It's a nutritional issue. That's malnutrition. But that's a food insecurity problem. We don't have the enough food or the right food. And the solution was to develop a, a, a golden rice variety that's very high in vitamin A, very high in beta carotene. Okay? Um, so the root cause of hunger and malnutrition is poverty. Back to the same thing. Too many people, not enough resources. It's financial, it's social. They're in a state of poverty where they just can't meet their own, their own needs. And we've already talked about this a little bit in our very first lecture. Okay? Um, okay, what, what are we talking about with this food insecurity? What kinds of things are the problems? Well, easiest way to do it is look at macronutrients, things like protein, carbohydrate, and fat, right? Those are the macronutrients. We've got to have enough protein, especially, again, it's, it's the, the women and children that are most affected by this because the, they're the people growing or maybe they're pregnant or whatever. They're just not getting enough of these macronutrients. Specifically, most of the time, it's protein that they're just not getting <coughs> enough of, right? Uh, micronutrients could be any of the vitamins. It could be a mineral. It could be copper. It could be iron. Um, and those could be an issue in, in their diet because it's not a very balanced diet, probably. Okay? Um, and so chronic hunger, if you don't get enough food, obviously leads to malnutrition, not getting the right kind of food. Okay? Small difference, but an important difference. Okay? Oh, my God. We just had, uh, sorry, the, the air conditioner just blew up or something. The fan just, the fan got a flat tire. Did you guys hear that? Um, anyway, um, so one example would be, uh, be a lack of iodine, and that causes uh, goiter. And goiter is a problem with your thyroid glands that are up in your, up in your throat here. And that's all about metabolism. Too much thyroxine that's produced by the thyroid gland causes overnutrition so, uh, or overmetabolism. So these folks are pretty hyper. They, they can't get enough food. The opposite is true with too little thyroxine. Can you lead to chronic obesity and, and some other nutritional problems? Okay? Those are metabolic diseases. Okay, So again, that's malnutrition. Often comes again, though, when we... We don't, when we have a food security problem, we just don't have enough food, okay? This one is tragic. I've actually, to a certain extent, experienced this. This, this slide here is of a group of uh, folks actually collecting ants. I think, if I remember rightly, this, oh, it is in the Sudan, um, because they're just desperately trying to get more protein. And it causes a problem called kashioko. If you Look at, if you can look at it carefully, or the fellow in front, you'll notice that he's very skinny, but he has a big belly. And that's Koshioko is, is the, tech, the actual name for that disease. And it's a malnutrition. It's a lack of protein. Um, so they're basically wasting away, just as you would in a concentration camp, where your body goes and basically takes your own protein for, for nutrition. Um, so you basically have muscle wasting going on, but you have this big belly. Okay, solutions. So these are the same solutions we, we kind of talked about with poverty in general. It's, like I said, focused often on the younger people in the population. And if we immunize children, then we won't have the stress from having other diseases that we're that will be more prevalent because they're undernourished in the first place. Their the immune systems are broken down. Okay, uh, encourage breastfeeding. That's a natural. You know, uh, many societies moved away from that. That wasn't kind of the cool thing to do. Okay, prevent dehydration from diarrhea. Most of these diseases, the the uh, symptoms are diarrhea. If it's cholera, something like that. 
the kids are going to get diarrhea. So let's minimize that. Then they don't lose a bunch of that nutrition before it can be properly uh, processed and metabolized. Okay. Uh, provide supplements. Provide family planning. Again, we're back to the root cause of, of this issue. It sounds, it sounds kind of uh, crass and, and, and nasty thinking, but it's too many kids in the first place. Too many, these, these areas that we're talking about are, have got that exponential growth in the population. Okay, that very rapid growth. Uh, increase education for women and then sustainable ag practices. Let's get them drip irrigation or a way to irrigate their crops. Let's get them uh, and teach them how to use uh, the, the manures of the animals and, and have better soil practices to where they don't lose their soil. Okay. Overnutrition is an interesting one. Eating too much. Um, in the United States, um, they estimate, according to a Boston study, that 60% of American adults are overweight and 33% 30 are obese. So that's this huge percentage of folks. And the, the interesting thing is Americans apparently spend about $42 billion per year trying to lose weight. And actually to eliminate world hunger, one of the estimates is $24 billion. So we've got this problem that we've got too much nutrition and we're, we're, not, we're not eating properly. We're not eating the right things, and we're often eating too much. Okay? So that's, that's kind of the opposite program, problem, which obviously is in stark contrast to those kids out there collecting ants. right? Um, so, and the interesting thing is, as, as a sustainable issue, health is one of our sustainability issues, overfed and underfed all have... Uh, health issues that are associated with them, right? Whether on the overfed side, it might be heart issues. On the underfed side, we've just talked that the immune systems are so broken down that they're very prevalent to any disease that might come along. They, they can't re resist. They don't have, can't be immune to diseases, okay? Um, food production. Let's talk about what, what are we talking about here? Really, the most important thing to look at in food production is the staples. Most diets, we don't really notice this because we're so diverse. We have, you know, we have Korean food and Vietnamese food and, and, and Mexican food, and we're so diverse. But in other cultures, it's very based on these staples. So many of the Asian countries, for example, are very based on the rice as, as basically a staple, right? And that's half of the world's calories that are consumed are in these three staples. So we need to look at what's going on in the production of those staples. Um, how much land's being used? Well, 11% of, of land, 11% uh, of land, 77% of our crop lands are focused towards those three things. So three quarters of all the land that we have under agricultural production is used for producing that. But we only have 11% of the land that can be used because obviously these kinds of crops, we can't grow them on mountainsides, we can't grow them in rocky soils, all kinds of places we can't grow them, right? Um, and the other thing is that the large percentage of folks depend on the ocean. And so fisheries are very important and that's an area that is at the moment very over harvested and that is a natural resource that's under severe stress. So then we need to look at aquaculture, how we grow fish in a farming environment, in ponds and in lakes and, and how, we, how we do aquaculture because again that society is dependent on fish. What they want to eat and where they get their protein from is through fish. So we, we need to figure out how to support that. And aquaculture is one of the ways to, to meet that need. Okay? Uh, so two-thirds of the world people survive on these three grains. Problem is, if you know anything about those three grains, biggest problem is they, they're pretty good nutritionally. They're obviously mostly carbohydrate. They're very low in protein. Okay? They're not enough protein. You're at about 10, 8 to 10%, depending on the grain. And we need 12 to 14% to be healthy. 
So the protein always becomes a problem. So where do they get that protein from is always really critical. Okay, what is sustainable agriculture then? Okay, so we, we're going to use sustainable agriculture, things like aquaculture, to meet these nutritional needs, right? Um, there are specific management and procedures that we <laughs> use to produce, uh, to produce food, okay? Um, so we're getting on our getting away from me here, but, and so first thing is we're going to define sustainability again. Um, obviously, we've just done that in the first chapter, so I'll let you guys work through that. It's providing for the needs of the future while taking care of ourselves. In this case, in agricultural sense, I read your, your, um, some of your stuff on this, and, um, but it's specifically focused towards food. Right. What do we need to do to provide that basic resource of food? Right. Food and water and clean air is what we really need as people. Okay. So, what are some of the themes? Stewardship, taking better care of what we have, managing our resources, taking responsibility. Um, it's a systems perspective. We shouldn't focus in on one little area, one little problem. We need to look at the whole system. So we're going to look basically in this class is in the in the first world we have industrialized agriculture. Big monocultures where we grow just one crop in an area with big machinery, lots of pesticides, genetically modified seeds, lots of energy being used, big technology and what is the um, what is the alternative? Okay? We have to look at the whole systems. We're proposing, basically, what we're really doing is proposing a, a, a perspective where we look at a different system, which would be a more of a sustainable agricultural system, right? Um, it needs to be interdisciplinary. You can't get to just be an expert on corn. You need to know a little bit about water management. You need to know about integrated pest management, how we do pest management better and things like that. And you have to have a little bit of an economics background to be a farmer. It's very interesting. And it's a process. We can't take the American farm as it stands today and all of a sudden, you know, basically have <laughs> growing one acre and using the chicken manure and, and make it not very intensive. We are very intensive and we need to be intensive. So how do we make this intensive farming more sustainable? Okay. Um, and we need to, need to educate people and inspire people to take responsibility for their part of it. Okay? Modern agriculture is in crisis. Um, our agricultural productivity is being undermined because of the techniques we're using right now of industrial agriculture. Um, and uh, so what, how is it being undermined? What are some of the really big in, it, issues? Well. We have destruction of the natural capital. We're overusing the soil. We're letting the soil erode and wash away, um, things like that. We are too dependent on energy, which makes us too dependent on fossil fuels. And we know that's a problem for several reasons. Those are running out. And then, of course, climate change and global warming. Um, removing, we need to not remove the responsibility of growing food away from the local farmer, the people on the land, the people locally here that are, that are producing for our farmer's market. We need to keep it there because they understand how to be the best stewards of the land. A big corporation isn't focused on being good stewards of the land. They're focused on making a profit. Okay, intensive, some of the practices. So let's look at uh, agriculture because many of you probably haven't been exposed to agriculture the way I have, uh, for example. That's kind of been most of my life, other than teaching. And what, what are some of these practices we're talking about in industrial is uh, very super intensive. What, so these things that are, are, have led us down a path where we're producing plenty of food, like we just said, but we're also destroying our natural capital. Okay, So it's intensive tillage, right? Big tractors plowing the ground. That's tillage. We turn over the soil. And we're going to learn that that's not the best practice. There's a better way to do that. Monoculture. Okay? 
growing one crop over and over and over in the same land is a bad <laughs> idea. It takes away the basic nutrients from that area. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Irrigation. And irrigation, we know that we need irrigation for agriculture, especially in California where we're very dry. We're going to have to put water. But how do we do it? We should be more efficient. At the moment, I think it's over 60% of cropland in California is flood irrigated. So you flood the land. Well, what are the problems with that? It's going to get evaporate very fast. We're going to have a very high percentage of loss. And we're also going to cause salts to be left in the soil. Salinization, when that evaporates, leaves the salts behind and the, the soil can get too salty. Okay, there's better ways to do that. We're going to see them, those on our field trip. There's drip irrigation. There are these big boom systems that use low pressure systems and use a lot less water. Chemical pest control and synthetic fertilizers. We're going to go into each one of these. Synthetic fertilizers, we take minerals, mine in the ground, and we make a fertilizer. That's what you most often see at Home Depot in those little granules or in that little bottle of, of miracle Grow. Those are synthetic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers, natural fertilizers, are taking uh, crop wastes or animal wastes, and in some countries, human wastes, and putting them back on the land. Those are natural organic fertilizers, right? Uh, chemical pest control, using pesticides. Uh, many of these pesticides are very damaging uh, in other ways. Um, Genetic manipulation of crop plants, whether it's by actual genetic engineering or if it's by very intensive crossbreeding and hybridization. Confined feeding operations. This is what we're going to see out at the dairy. We bring all the animals together and we bring the feed to them. Old thing was the animals went out to get their food, out onto the pasture, out onto the range. These are how we produce our meat at the moment in, in a first world country. Energy use, all, all dairy products, all milk. Energy use in agriculture, again, very intensive, big equipment, sometimes equipment that just allows us to harvest faster and better, but, but maybe there, there are better ways of doing this. Okay, um, so industrialized food production or high input monocultures, the trick here is 80% of the world's food supply comes from that. Whether it's a monoculture like in Kansas of corn, whether it's these massive greenhouse structures and greenhouse, intensive greenhouses. We don't see that locally as much, but if you go right across the border into Baja and get down about 60 miles, there's massive greenhouse operations down there, producing the veggies that you guys are buying right here at Stater Brothers. <coughs> specifically the tomatoes, not the tomatoes, but the tomatoes. Um, so here's some of these practices. Here's flood irrigation going on. This is actually interesting enough. This is floriculture. This is growing flowers. It's another big industry, ag industry in, in California, um, is, is growing flowers. Uh, growing timber is also agriculture, by the way. Um, this is one of my favorite slides. You can see the dust coming up there. Um, and that, those are, uh, are, are pecans, not pecans, but almonds. And there's this crazy little machine that comes along. And I was driving along a road here a few years ago, and I just saw all this dust. And basically that little, that little machine looks like some little, some little rodent comes up to these trees and puts these arms around it and shakes the tree. And all the almonds fall on the ground, and then right behind comes a big vacuum truck. You know, like you see those trucks that go along and pick up dirt along the side of the road. Well, they vacuum up the almonds. Well, they also vacuum up a bunch of other junk, too. But that's super intensive uh, agriculture. You know, we, we produce 98% of the world's almonds. But um, do we really need to do it like that? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Okay. Big trucks, there's a truck leaving the fields behind there in the San Joaquin Valley. I'm going to talk a lot about the San Joaquin Valley. You need to know where that is. Bakersfield, up to Reading, most intensive agriculture in the world. They're taking tomatoes out. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. You, you guys have got to go? Out. You guys have got to go? Huh? 
No, no, I just had a question. Okay, go, I yeah, please. I don't understand the difference between industrialized agriculture and plantation agriculture. Oh, excellent. They're both industrialized agriculture. Plantation agriculture is specific to certain crops. It's kind of a nebulous term. So we could have a plantation of bananas. We could have a plantation of, uh, of, of palms for palm oil. We could have a plantation of trees. Uh, like a coffee plantation, where we're growing one crop intensively. We could have a plantation like they have in Costa Rica of teak trees to grow wood, where your forest, you don't have the forest. In South Africa, we don't have natural forests very much, so, and, and they're all protected. So our wood has to be grown. So when I was in South Africa this last time, we'd see large plantations of uh, eucalyptus gum trees or pine trees. And that's used for paper and it's used for lumber and all of that. So that's just a form of agriculture, but it is industrialized agriculture most of the time. Only, the only time it wouldn't be is when we marry those two. So for example, you guys go to Starbucks, right? And you, you hear about shade produced coffee. That's when they leave the natural vegetation there. They leave some of the big trees and they plant the coffee trees or bushes underneath it. So now it's, not, it's much more sustainable. We're, we haven't destroyed a whole landscape to plant that coffee. But that's what plantation, does that, does that answer your question? So is plantation agriculture generally more for cash crops, whereas it does exactly. agriculture? Exactly. Well, yeah, it could be for cash crops, but it can be for staples and important stuff. So you could make the, the case that any of those fruits, mangoes, uh, which are grown in plantations, for example. I'd like to make the case, because I love mangoes, so that, that they're not just a cash crop, but they're also a staple and a, and a basic needed crop. But yes, cash crop is a word we use for actually just about any crop that we grow beyond our own subsistence, right? So yes, good question. Okay. Does, does that help with plantation? They're a form of industrialized agriculture most of the time. But sometimes we could have a plantation that's actually uh, much more sustainable, depending, like the example of the shade-grown coffee. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, please drive in, because at the moment, the way we're doing this, oh, actually, I can see you guys over here. I've got over here. But yeah, please drive, dive in with questions. Okay, so how much more time do you guys have today, actually? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So we'll, I'll just keep lecturing. You'll have this video up, um, and it will all be good. And, and uh, just, I uh, guess, your next challenge is to, is to view these two videos and, and read that uh, chapter for that, that section. I think it's 22 through 39. It's not very much reading for the quiz 2A. So, all right, we'll keep going. Okay, oh, wait a minute. This is really important, this, this slide. This looks at globally, again, we're looking at things globally, what's going on with industrialized agriculture? That's the green, okay? So all across the world, that green is, um, is industrialized agriculture. The one I like to contrast it with, and this shows you the, our problem with distribution. You see where the green is? United States, uh, South America, all through Europe, Australia, South Africa at the very end there very industrialized agriculture. Nomadic herding, which means, that means people at a state where they have to move the animals to find their food. And they depend on the animals for all their food, like the Maasai, right? They depend on the milk and even the blood of those animals to, to survive. Well, they have to follow the, the rains and follow the food supply. So that's a very much a subsistence level kind of agriculture, right? And look where that is, all across the top of Africa, all the way into Asia, places that we have extreme poverty and extreme population growth. Okay, So um, that's where, what we're looking at. The foods produced over the United States, how do we get it to the Sudan? Well, the United States does a wonderful job of doing that. Take care, you guys. We'll, uh, we'll, see, we'll see you next week. Oh, uh, when's your vacation? When's your, are you guys on... Uh, on break next week?
Next two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Okay. And Miss Miss Pike, did we did they get all the field trip forms signed? All those things that we still have. Um, I think I'm missing five still. Okay. Can you guys please, 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 please bring those tomorrow? Please don't forget yeah. because I need to pick those up by the end of the week. I'll come by Friday and pick those up, Miss Pike. Okay. I'll have them ready for you. Thank you very much. Bye. bye bye okay so continuing on here um, so satellite images um, of greenhouse production what we're looking at there back in 1974 and then on on the on the left and 2000 on the right tremendous number of greenhouses going in that's actually in Spain um, so just looking at intensive agriculture it's fairly new thing after after basically the 60s and the 70s, we have this very industrialized agriculture. Okay, so let's look at some of these, these monocultures or these high input industrialized system. Livestock production. We need to look at what we call feedlots, these confined feeding operations. Um, and they're used to fatten up the cattle and sometimes raise them for a lot of their life in a very intensive spot where we bring them very nutritious high-end foods, okay? And this has caused controversy for a number of reasons. Basically, why are we feeding human food, corn and stuff like that, to these animals? Is that really the smart way to go? Because they take that food and, and basically, just like us, anytime you move up the, the food web, you lose 90% of that. It's just used up in nutrition and given off as heat and you get 10% value for, for that nutrition. So people are saying, why don't we eat down the food chain? Why don't people eat that and we don't depend so much on meat? And that's a valid conversation to have. Um, I'm not sure that you're going to change the folks in the United States or first world countries to, to think like that very much, but it's a valid conversation. And then we're looking at problems. We, we had overcrowding in cages. So I think it's four years ago now, uh, we introduced Proposition 2, which limits the number of, of chickens, for example, that you can have in one of, those, one of those metal cages for eggs or for any other kind of production. Okay. Um, so also our croplands. We talked about how there's a limited amount of cropland, only 11% of the world's land is being used for cropland. Again, why it's a valid conversation as to why we're feeding so much of that to animals. Well, part of the reason is as, as certain societies have become more affluent, the first thing they want to do is eat better. And that means animal products and it means meat. And it's just kind of a cost of cost of growth, cost of development, if you want to say it that way. Okay, so, um, so the U.S. uses, this is a quick little case study on industrial agriculture. We uh, produce 17% of the world's grain, but again, we have to distribute it. And we di distributed that a lot through humanitarian aid. And I'm very proud, personally, of the United States doing this, getting food into Sudan. But it's very hard to do because when you send the food over there, Normally, one faction or the other takes charge of it, and then they resell it or use it for themselves. It's very hard to actually get the food to the, the people that really need it. Okay, here's the pictures of the United States. This is a water canal in, uh, in central California near Fresno. Again, this is water going out there, in this case to almond trees. This is the kind of inf infrastructure we have to have to do this highly intensive industrial scale agriculture. And by the way, back to that last example, that's a plantation. Pecans are, not pecans, but almonds in that case are plantation agriculture. Okay, um, in terms of industrial food production in the United States, very intensive. That's just looking at a little schematic there of dairy, what, how much it costs um, in terms of, of resources. But look at 17% look at, uh, of the commercial energy in the United States goes towards food production. Okay? 24,000 kilometers is the average distance that a food product travels by the time it's gone, grown, transported sometimes all the way across the world, 
then shipped to a Walmart distribution site, then shipped back to the Walmart. Um, actually, it's, it's crazy. Why can't we grow it locally in your backyard? And, 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 and then there would be no distribution costs with all that energy uh, being used up and a lot more waste. Every time you have to transport something, you're going to have things go off and go bad and you're going to have more waste. Um, traditional agriculture, an answer to this would be, like I said, growing it ourselves using uh, alternative methods. One of those is polyculture, the idea of doing se several genetic varieties of corn at the same time. Why would we want to do that? Well, certain kinds of corn are more resistant to a certain pest than others. And so that's why you'd want to do that. They, they use slightly different nutrients from the soil. Intercropping. That would be a, an example of intercropping would be that shade-grown shade coffee where we've got maybe a plantation of teak trees. I've seen this in Costa Rica. And then coffee between it. So the, 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 we're getting two crops. They have different effects. The, the teak trees are shading the coffee, which helps the coffee and we're producing a product from those teak trees for a very valuable uh, lumber. Agroforestry, crops of trees grown together, polyculture, different plants planted together. We have an example from this from our history, from, from our native people. They grew what are called the three sisters. They like to grow corn, beans, and, and uh, corn, beans, and squash together and they all supported each other literally the squash or or the beans grew up the corn and they used different nutrients the the legume the uh the beans produces nitrogen fixes nitrogen which which is an essential nutrient in the soil um, for for growth and so they grew wonderfully well together so that's what's called polyculture growing things but we could do that on them and do do that on a much larger scale Okay, so there's an example of, of intercropping, growing corn between some kind of a tree there that's being used, produced for lumber. Um, another thing we want to talk about that happens as a result of overuse of the land or in sometimes industrial scale is desertification. We're going to have a whole section on this, but where the land goes to desert because we overgraze or we overcrop something. And this is literally what happened back in the Dust Bowl. I don't think thought we had an example here. I guess it's not. But um, in the Dust Bowl era where we overused the land in Texas and Oklahoma and it turned to desert. It's somewhat recovered since then, uh, but it turned to desert and all the soil blew away to where now we've, we've, we've got an unproductive uh, area, a desert basically. Okay, um, severe and moderate desertification. So again, where is that happening? The one that stands out to me is here. How could it be that right here, where we are, how could it be that we're overusing our land and not managing properly and, and causing desertification of our area? And you'd say, well, we're already desert. Well, we're not really. We're, we're a semi-desert. We're a very productive, biodiverse semi-desert. So why is this? That... That, to me, is just poor management, poor stewardship. Okay, uh, salinization and waterlogging. Again, if we over-irrigate, we flood irrigate, it'll cause the soil to become salty as that water evaporates, and it'll also cause waterlogging. Plants don't actually want to be flooded continue, with a few exceptions. Rice likes to be flooded when it's younger, but... Um, it's, it's an issue in that, again, what it, the root cause of that is bad irrigation projects, so, uh, technology. So we could just do a better job of, of, of our technologies for irrigation, and we avoid this wastage, we avoid this reduction in, in production, and uh, we're much more sustainable. Okay? There's a picture of some salinization. That's, that's salty crust on the on the water, on the land there. Okay, now we're going to look at um, some, of the, some of the answers to, to those practices. Be, pay careful attention to those conventional or industrialized practices, right? Monoculture, 
over tillage, energy, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers. Now we're going to look at the answers. Well, there's a technology and a way of doing things called no-till, no tillage. So literally, if I'm going to plant this carpet here in front of me, um, I would come along with, with what's called a seeder that actually injects the seed into the ground. So I don't have to turn the soil, okay? And therefore, I don't lose a lot for soil erosion. I don't break down the structure of the soil. Actually use nutrients. Some of those nutrients will actually volatilize, go into the air. And it's very, 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 very uh, effective. Increases crop reels, raises soil carbon contents, lowers water use, lowers pesticides. Those are some of the advantages. Okay, other things we can do that are good farming practice is we can use terracing or contour farming. That's when I make a terrace around the slope of the hill. Why do I do that? Because then I can prevent the water from flowing down the hill and causing what's called sheet erosion, where it just erodes the, the hillside, takes all my soil away. Because remember, we're going to learn soil is this very valuable little area. It's, it's an ecosystem. And we don't, can't lose that topsoil. It's not dirt. It's a living ecosystem that is, provides the, the, the ecosystem, the habitat, as it were, for the plants to grow. Right? We could use strip cropping. We talked about that. We could took alley cropping, which is basically the same thing. And we could use windbreaks. Locally, we have the Resource Conservation District that I serve on, and we promote people putting up windbreaks because locally most of our erosion happens from wind. So when you guys see a dust storm, what I see is a tragedy because that just means all our soil is getting blown and probably landing on barstow. And so in your backyard out there, out next to the lows up here, that just means that land's going to be way more unproductive. Okay, so um, the Green Revolution is um, really one of the things we need to talk about. This, this happened in the 1950s, and um, this is when we, we first started looking at high-input agriculture. So we started looking at what technology it would be, what kinds of genetic plants we'd have to. They developed wharf rice. Um, they started looking at intensive use of pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, all those industrialized practices. And they called it the Green Revolution, which was great. And they were excited about it because if you look at that first graph there, it caused an increase in production, a dramatic increase. And so, again, we have enough food. We just don't have it in the right places. But if you look over on the right at the green, at the green curve, it's a little bit of a different story. Because you've got um, per capita, you see it went up for a while. What is that? Into the 1980s probably. But now it's dropping back off again. So that means per person, we have about the same food that we had back in the 1960s. Okay? When we, this amazing green revolution. So worldwide, it actually hasn't made a difference. right? So we've got more food, but it's not getting to all the people moral of that story. Okay? Green Revolution had all the same kinds of problems that the industrial agriculture has because it is where the industrial agriculture started. Okay? Depletion of groundwater supplies, inefficient irrigation methods, flooding versus drip, for example, salt buildup, and then just the cost. It costs money to irrigate crops, specifically, for example, in electricity. Farmers will tell you all the time, I couldn't produce alfalfa any longer in the Barstow Hinkley area or here locally because the electricity cost went up and my cost of selling the alfalfa as horse hay um, wasn't, what, it just wasn't economical anymore. Okay? Um, part of the Green Revolution too, which is a problem, is we lost, is a loss of genetic variety. We started just focusing in on three or four seeds that were the best producers. They, they produced the tomatoes that were lasted the longest and they were the reddest and they were the biggest. But were they the best nutritionally? Uh, no, they weren't. And so we, we lost that. And so now there's a big movement that we're part of here at the college called seed saving, 
we save and, and preserve and, and promote the use of what's called heirloom seeds. You know, your, your heir to some of these are called heirloom seeds, H-E-I-R-L-O-O-M, and we're about seed saving. And we'll be watching later in the class um, a, a video called Seed the Untold Story, where, we, where it'll really focus in on this particular consequence of the green revolution or industrialized agriculture. So this is probably um, the key. You must pay attention to the slide. These are all the, the natural capital degradation, the issues that come from industrialized agriculture. Okay, So study those very carefully. We're going to come, be coming back to those on a, on a regular basis. But if you look at that list, you'll see we've covered most of those already, right? And they're in different classes, but they're all sustainable. There's biodiversity. Remember, biodiversity is one of our three principles. Soil, water, air pollution, and then human health and nitrates. Out at the ranch, out in Hinkley, the dairy farm, we will be talking specifically about the nitrates that, if they aren't properly managed, can come from the, the, the urine and the feces of those cattle out there. Okay, the gene revolution. A couple of things, we, we're going to have a specific, this is a, just a general introduction today, but we're going to go into this in great uh, detail. We're going to go into the GMO issue, the genetically modified uh, issue. And, but you need to know that we've been doing this for hundreds of, if not thousands of years. We've been taking certain types of breed. This is what Gregor Mendel did in his original genetic studies, right? He took types of beans and you breed it to other types. Well, you pick the highest producing one and the most pest resistant. You breed them together and they hybridize and you produce a better bean, for example. And we've been doing that forever. And so that's not genetic engineering. That's just hybridization and gene and, and selection. Okay? And we've been increasing, if you were, the natural selection process by doing that for a long, long time. Then we got the technology of genetic engineering, basically taking a gene from some other often different plant or animal and injecting it into the, the gene, the genome of whatever crop we were trying to improve. That's GMO. That's genetically modified organisms. And that's an important distinction we don't kind of necessarily want to throw, even if we don't agree with GMOs in certain situations, we don't want to necessarily throw out the fact that, that hybridization and breeding, genetic uh, selection, is, is something we will have to continue to do as we face problems. Let's say the problem is, is uh, producing a corn that can grow in a very dry environment. Well, at the moment, they have a GMO that can do that. And so what are we going to do? Are we going to let the people in Africa starve, literally, or are we going to give them that corn? And by the way, they, who, do, who makes that corn? Well, the big, ugly Monsanto, you know, the people who produce that. So are we going to work with Monsanto to make that happen, just like the Gates Foundation is doing? Or are we just going to say Monsanto is evil and throw that out? Well, we're going to have a whole group of people that are affected by that. So again, these are balanced decisions we have to make as a society, sustainability decisions, based on understanding the full concept. Sometimes it sounds great to say no GMOs, and I agree with no GMOs, for example, in the United States. There's, there's no real reason for it here. Um, but in other parts of the world, it is really a, quite a valid reason. So here's just talking about uh, mixing genes, genetic engineering itself. So I'm going to go over this very quickly fast right now. Uh, you don't have to really focus in on this stuff, but you have to have a under, basic understanding of what genetic engineering is. The gene revolution come up with um, some amazing products that are very valuable and if used wisely I think are a good thing personally, like the wing bean. Uh, producing more meat. Uh, we're not actually changing, the, the slides change track yet. Got to get away from GMOs for a moment. Very little of our meat is, is GMO, right? Well, actually, none of it is. But um, we definitely use uh, confined feeding operations. Lots of people are using growth hormone. 
way too much. In fact, but that's going away. They're using low levels of, uh, of antibiotics to keep the animals healthy. And um, this is an issue. We, we want the, the meat. We enjoy our meat. We enjoy those products. But how can we do it where the in, environmental impacts and the social impacts sometimes are lessened? Okay. Um, many people will support food production. Uh, you know, depending on it, 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 again, it's a socioeconomic thing. The people that have money, there's a huge surge now in, uh, in China in terms of these, these products for the, for, the, for the more wealthy people. That's dairy products. They support the whole dairy industry in New Zealand, and they're making their own dairy industry in China. Because once people get money, they want to eat better. It's, it's just, just part of the game. So it's up to us to make sure that the way we're producing that, that stuff is more sustainable. It's, so interesting thing uh, uh, that we will cover a little bit more, but also depends on what that protein source is. If it's beef cattle, it actually takes a lot more uh, nutrients, a lot more grain and protein to produce that. So you can see that the difference there, um, grain needed per kilogram of body weight. So for, for beef cow to produce, to produce one kilogram of body weight takes seven kilograms. Pigs are at four, chickens are much more efficient at 2.2, and fish are the most, we're talking aquaculture, artificially raised, uh, ag grazed fish are the most efficient. So that's important. That's a difference of seven to two, three times, more than three times more efficient and sustainable for us to grow fish if that's what people want in their culture. We always have to look at the cultural concept. If we just said to the United States, hey, sorry guys, no more beef, no more McDonald's, all you now get is, is catfish. Uh, it's not going to work. It's just not, not even practical. We need to look at, okay, guys, how do we do meat production more sustainably in terms of beef? We're very much focused on beef, okay? Um, so the real quick thing on, on, on fish, while we're talking about it, um, we've seen spectacular rises um, in the wild catch. If you look over here at, the, at this blue graph, the first one. Um, and so we've come up with amazing technology, right? The drag nets, the, 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 fish, uh, the fish factories that are deployed out in the ocean, right? Most of the fish is now processed right out there and they just basically take what they want and throw the rest back. Wastage is huge. They're dragging the ocean floor. Maybe it's for shrimp, but they're destroying the ocean floor basically while they're doing it, okay? Very, very technology-based. Um, and so we see a huge increase in the wild catch, but at the same time, we're starting to see a big, big increase in aquaculture, you know, farm-raised uh, fish products, okay? But the world fish, fish catch per person, if you look at the, the graph on the right, is starting to drop off. And so that just shows you that, again, we've got more people than we, we can feed. And the problem with the wild fish catch problem is that we're overfishing, overharvesting certain regions to where we're actually, it's not sustainable. Okay, so fish would be a renewable resource. And if we overharvest, then that renewability goes away. It's over the, over the uh, renewable uh, uh, I'll think of the word at the moment, the, the, uh, the limit of what it can, can renew itself, right? There's a real simple word for that. Okay, government subsidies. What, what can cause some of this and how can we affect change? Just like we've talked at the, in the very first lecture, how the government responds is really important. Is the government subsidizing these fishing fleets as the Japanese government does with their whale, their whale ships, right? They'll send out those whalers down into the Antarctic. Those are heavily government subsidized. They say they're for research, but often they're just seeking small parts of those whales and throwing the rest away. That shouldn't be the focus. That if the 
if the uh, Japanese government, and not necessarily just picking on them, but if they want to do that, then they should, you couldn't aquaculture whales, but you could aquaculture some other fish and put the subsidies into a more sustainable practice. Okay, aquaculture, looking at the advantages and disadvantages. Um, high efficiency needs large inputs of land, feed, and water, large waste output, destroys mango forests. Often they'll go in and harvest the little baby shrimps from the mango forests and the estuaries that are our most productive areas. Um, dense populations are vulnerable to disease. Tanks become too contaminated after about five years, or they contaminate the local beaches. If you go down to Mexico, and between Tijuana and Ensenada, you've got that gorgeous two-lane uh, double highway that goes down the ocean. You'll see some, some rings, and those are uh, uh, mostly uh, tuna. And I think, I can't remember, I think they're mostly tuna that they're growing in basically their big rings and their big nets hanging down, and they bring the food to them. Well, if you go on those beaches close to that, you'll notice that they've become quite contaminated from... From that, and right in Ensenada, in the Bay at Ensenada, you have that. So um, we don't have to go very far to see this. But um, there's advantages and disadvantages, and again, all comes down to: Are we going to be able to feed the people? Okay, um, up to 90% of the world's food is wasted. Uh, so again, how does the government get involved? We can control prices. When we keep prices artificially low, that's an that's that's a way of, that they're actually subsidizing. Uh, we can provide subsidies to keep farmers in business and, and sustainable practices. We can, through the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as we do locally, we can actually give them an, what's called an equip grant to put in one of those highly efficient systems that we're going to see when we go out there. Um, and we can let the marketplace decide. We can make it a supply and demand thing. So that's the way governments can be open it up. So now quickly looking at old style uh, pest management. Uh, what's that all about when we use extensive use of pesticides? Where did this all start? Where did this, this interest in, in pesticides and pollution? Rachel Carson, back in the 70s, basically raised the flag and said, you know, we just have polluted our rivers, for example, to such an extent that in Chicago, a, a whole river actually caught on fire. Um, it was, was so polluted. Okay. And then we've had super pests. We're continually uh, fighting against this, that we're continually getting invasives coming from other countries, and we don't have the natural predators for them. Or through antibiotics and through pesticide resistance, we develop these super pests. Uh, what can you do um, if you don't want to, uh, you know, eat food and, and be exposed to these pesticides? You can, you can produce your own food. You can buy organic food. You can wash and scrub your fruit and vegetables. You can eat less or no meat. And you can trim fat from meat. Pesticides, antibiotics, and all that tend to, if they're going to be in, in meat, they'll be in the fat. Okay. Uh, what's the answer? Integrated pest management. So there's what we do with integrated pest management. We don't use nearly as much pesticides. We use, uh, we use beneficial insects. We introduce them that, that combat and, 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 and basically kill the, whatever the pest is. We're going to be going into integrated pest management. So synthetic pesticides, the answer, sustainable practice is integrated pest management. That's kind of all you guys need to know at this point. Um, solutions in sustainable agriculture um, is, again, back to how can we slow population growth. Really hard to do. You can't really legislate this. China tried this. India tried it. And it was really a, a pretty dismal, dismal failure. Um, it worked, but it had serious social consequences. I don't know if you guys know that in, in China now, there's this huge disproportion between male children and female of, your, of, of, of kind of young adult age. And that's not so cool. 
Okay, so sustainable organic agriculture. What what are the advantages? Again, this is a these slides are very important to talk to because when you have to write a little uh, description of this in on a test or whatever, these are you've got your points right here to build build on. What 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 are the advantages of organic agriculture? We're going to have a whole lecture and focus on organic agriculture again. Industrialized pesticide use and synthetic fertilizers. Answer is organic sustainable approach or the different processes and procedures for organic agriculture. Okay, um, we need to make the uh, the transition to sustainable agriculture. Remember one of the principles: we need to move that way. We can't just all of a sudden say, "Hey, we're not we're not doing any monoculture anymore. We're not growing corn like that." In in, in Kansas. Economically, that's not viable. Socially, it's not viable. And environmentally, you know, I'm not sure. Um, if we just let that land go fallow, all that's going to happen is that erosion is going to increase. Okay? So, um, roads to sustainability, and that's the end. Okay? So, that's it for Lecture 5. Thank you very much.